move on to our next session today, which will be run by Dr. Charlene Leroy Dyer, and she'll be speaking on the topic of equity and access towards understandings of disadvantage in higher education. Charlene is a saltwater woman with family ties to the Darug, Awabakal, Garagal, and Wurundjeri nations. Charlene is the president of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Postgraduate Association and an executive member and board member of the Council of Australian Postgraduates Association. Charlene is a full-time academic at the University of Queensland Business School, where she is a senior lecturer in employment relations and associate director PRME Indigenous. As an Aboriginal activist, student leader and unionist, Charlene is, a passionate, um, is passionate about improving the standard of education, the inclusivity and access at universities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students and for those from equity groups. I believe Charlene is also joined by two very special guests today. Um, Jeremy Heathcote is a proud Aboriginal man from the Awabakal Nation who has strong connections to the local area in Sydney. He is employed at the University of Sydney in a role that works on internal and external Indigenous agenda with medicine and health. Jeremy is an active member of the NTEU where he is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representative at the university. He is currently studying suicidology at Griffin University, which links to the work he does within the Aboriginal community, particularly around his role as Deputy Chairman of the Bana Aboriginal Men's Group. Um, Anissa Jones um, is a Bubu Barongal Darug woman from the Hawkesbury River with ties to the Wormaloo clan from Prospect Hill. She has taught in schools and vocational institutions for over 20 years. Um, Anissa has a passion for First Nations pedagogy and its implementations in the school system as a way of giving Aboriginal students a sense of identity which can be lost in the curriculum and day-to-day -day musings of school life. Currently, Anissa is completing the Masters of Indigenous Languages Education at the University of Sydney to support Darug Dalan revitalisation. Thank you so much for joining us and all your Charlene. Oh, hi everyone, I'm um, Charlene. I'm a um, Garigal Darug Awabakal Wiradjuri woman from New South Wales. Um, currently a senior lecturer in employment relations at the University of Queensland. Um, so shall I just keep talking? <laughs> Our session today is on access. What is it on? Oh, God, sorry. I've just closed what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, access and inclusivity in universities. And we have some panellists. So we have Jeremy. Do you want to say hi, Jeremy? Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Jeremy here at um, University of Sydney, um, Trudy at Wobbacal Man as well. Um, I live on the land of the Barramatical people at Parramatta. And we have Tracy. Hi, I'm a Wobbacal Gwagal woman living on a Wobbacal country proudly and advocating for our mobs. I'm also a 56 year old um, undergraduate law student. Thank you to Charlene. And I'm all, have a joint studying a joint degree of global indigenous studies. Okay, thanks, Trace. I have two other panelists. I'm not sure if they're here yet. Right. Um, Taylor, who is actually in court and said that she will be out in time to Zoom, um, and Anissa Jones, who may be just be a little bit late. No, no, I'm here. I've already oh, done here. my intro. Sorry, I was Anissa, like running it. Here, guys. Sorry. Nisa, do you want to just introduce yourself? Oh, I already did. I did. Oh, I, okay. was, I was going to take over at one point. So. Oh, that's all right. You could take over. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, so sorry, um, Taylor might be late and as soon as I see her on the screen, um, we'll grab her, but we might just get into it. I did send people a copy of the questions that I was going to talk about today. Hopefully everyone got those right at the last minute and I'm really sorry it was the last minute. I've been on holidays and I actually went down back home to Newcastle for my sister's wedding and I gave the bride away 
And um, so I've just been in a bit of a holiday mode and got back today and yeah, just catching up. So um, my first question to our um, students is, when you think about access and inclusivity in universities, what does that actually mean for you? So might start with you, Jeremy, if that's okay. No problems. Um, yes, I'm, I'm, like I said up before, I'm in the introduction, I'm doing um, suicidology. Uh, I'm doing it online. Um, so it's not like my usual degrees that I've done before face-to-face. Um, but it's really great to have it be in a place where it actually is inclusive and they keep in touch with me all the time. Um, but personally, work at university, I think inclusivity is so important, especially for our First Nations people. Um, I work in a very unique role in medicine health. Uh, my role is engagement with staff, students and community internally and externally. So I get to work with um, staff and make sure they understand our cultural issues. Um, I worked on a faculty strategy we've got here in our faculty. Um, we, at University of Sydney, Medicine Health is probably the largest, well, it is the largest faculty. It's almost half the university. Um, we've actually got um, a strategy in place that actually includes um, Indigenous knowing, being and doing. So that's embedded within the work we're doing. Um, so I get to work with a lot of staff and educate them about different things. Um, also make sure that we promote the opportunities for our students. Um, and when they're here, there's a sp safe space to be here, called Be Safe. Um, it's one of the big things that I've been pushing. I worked in the sector for the last 12 years. It's something I've been pushing for that long. Um, making sure that it's an inclusive space and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are able to come here and be themselves um, and be empowered. It's something that I've seen as a failure in this sector, unfortunately. I think it's something that all universities should be working on is making sure that when someone does come here from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background or any other background, mind you, it's a safe place for them to come. Um, they're included in discussions especially with our first agent people, there's actually a voice for us as well. I mean, that's one of the, the key things that I think we've seen here in, in my faculty, at least, is Aboriginal people having a voice um, and being about to be involved in making sure that what's being taught to our students, both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, um, aligns to the cultural needs. Because um, as people know, in medicine and health, um, whatever job you go in, you're gonna meet an Aboriginal person. So if you can understand our history, our background, um, the different aspects of why we do the knowing, being and doing. I think that's really key. Um, I used to work in inclusion as well at this university and it's something that I've pushed there with the other areas as well, like cultural, um, the, the cold areas, um, disability, inclusion as well, um, LGBTQ. All those areas are, are the same issues. If we can make sure it's inclusive and we actually really do include people, not just um, lip service, actually have things in the right way, I think that's how we make a difference. We've actually increasing more students coming here from different backgrounds and also staying here. Retention is one of those key things. If it's not a safe place, they'll go to a different university, they'll quit university altogether. I think that's something I think all of us um, across the sector need to, to look at. So that, that's what I see is, as inclusivity in, in this university or in the university sector in, the, in general. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Anissa. Um, well, when I looked at that question, I had flashbacks to my own um, time as a first year uni student. Oh, that was a while ago. Um, so, yeah, no, it was. Um, and, you know, I was doing my Bachelor of Education, so education trained, um, and I had to do an Aboriginal unit. And it was run by a white Dutch man who just happened to be friends with Mob. I know Shalene's just like, oh my God. This was in the 90s before everyone got slightly more woke than they are now. But, um, you know, I, I took that and I ended up pretty much taking over the class because I was the only Aboriginal student in the room and a lot of it was put on my shoulders. And you do see that with a lot of Aboriginal students and teaching staff at university level, at TAFE, at schools, you name it, it's very much a oh you're the you know font of all knowledge I like to say the Aboriginal whisperer and you know and I say that tongue-in-cheek because that's not our role and it actually puts a lot of stresses on community um, particularly when that happens and you know I, I I loved my my teaching course don't get me wrong I had a ball I sadly caught the love bug with university and ended up doing a 
a couple of more quals. I've done a master's. I'm on my second master's now. I'm looking at a PhD. I don't know why. People are telling me I'm insane. Um, but, you know, different universities, I've been to a few. I've found that in the last 20 years of, of undertaking training, it's been very different. So in the 90s, there was, when I was at uh, Uni of Canberra, there was an Aboriginal centre. It was in the law building, but it was very small and very underfunded. And now it's like this gee whiz bang, amazing thing. And at Sydney, they've got the Gadigal Centre. You know, going in there, you actually do feel very safe walking in those doors. Down the road is um, Eora Campus for TAFE and I can go there and no issues. Like I, it, it's nice to be surrounded by like-minded individuals, whether they're, you know, the same race as you or if they are, you know, in the same course as you. Um, I think it's just a place to be safe. Like for me, it's, and I teach Diploma Aboriginal Studies now and I teach it online. We, we won't go there, um, but it's online and the majority of the students are Aboriginal. So it's a good safe space to be where we can, we can have a yarn. We, you know, a lot of them have graduated. It's a safe space. And I think that's, that's the reality that um, universities and other educational spaces need to have that. Uh, in the forefront because if we can't see us we can't be us so if we can't see aboriginal people finishing year 12 tafe university we're not going to get to you know becoming candidates like i've got so many cousins that have now got phds i'm slightly jealous but i also think when am i going to find the time to do it um but i want to do it not not just for my community but i want to do it for myself and you know the what I've seen from the university sector and their inclusivity is what makes me think which university I may choose to to do my PhD with. So I'm really mindful of of that, and I think a lot of mob do look at that. Um, and I think you know inclusivity. It, it's another issue is you know well I'm not smart enough to get into uni, and that's the other issue that needs to be addressed um, because we're not all numbers. Everyone has lived experiences that are different. And I didn't do so well in my ATAR and I'm on my second master's. So it's really not an indicator of your ability to do well at tertiary level. It's about who you are, who supports you, um, your stubbornness, as I've been told, um, to, to prove people wrong and to do, follow your heart and your passion. And we shouldn't be stopped because of a number either or a belief that we're too dumb to do it. And um, that that's the biggest, biggest thing for me. So, Thanks, Anissa. Now, I know Tracy's got some um, really good stories around this. <laughs> so, Tracy, do you want to talk? So just for I people, think that, I think probably that I think... already told you, but I actually taught Tracy. <laughs> I think I'll save some of that for question two, Charlene. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I have got my notes to address those issues. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm got, like Charlene can tell you how true they, um, they are. But um, just on question one, you know, um, everything that um, Jeremy and Anissa has said um, directly or indirectly about um, you know, belonging, safety, all those sorts of things are true and current and in 2022, but they were no different back when I finished school in the 19, you know, late 1970s. Um, I just want to go back a couple of decades because I can say to you that, you know, when I finished school, um, I was a media stereotypical Aboriginal black kid living in the inner city suburbs of Sydney. Um, then we moved out to the western suburbs at Parramatta where I finished, well I didn't actually finish school. Um, my mother was stolen generation. She was found herself through no fault of her own, a single mum with two children back in the 70s and there was no welfare back in them days. Centrelink didn't evolve until 1974, so there was no single mum's pensions. And um, my mum <clears throat> was not even old enough to work in pubs and clubs because back then you had to be 21. So she lied about her age, 
we moved every six months because my mum was scared welfare would take us from her, um, like she was taken from her mum. So when I turned 14, of course, I had to leave school to get a job, unqualified, uneducated, on everything, um, to help my mum pay the rent and put food in our mouth. Now, I wasn't in a remote Aboriginal community, as one might think of my story. I was living in downtown Parramatta in New South Wales. So that just goes to show that it wasn't that long ago that the expectations of us and the um, stereotypical reported Aboriginal, Aboriginal child lived in, you know. So I didn't have a choice but to leave school. A tertiary, tertiary a HSC or a tertiary, tertiary education for me was not an option. And even if I had tried, and we're back talking not long after, you know, within 10 years of Charlie Perkins and everyone else going to university, I was deemed not smart enough to go to university. So my whole life I have known that I was smart enough and believed I was intelligent enough um, to be an undergraduate and to have a bachelor's degree. Um, something I had never given up on. I had tried over many years to go to TAFE to get some sort of a certificate to say that I was good enough to have an education. Um, I never felt I belonged. I was the only black kid wherever I went. Um, if I couldn't fight with my fists, I couldn't, um, back in them days, exist or survive. And I'm also talking about in the school playground, in the TAFEs at Meadowbank, um, you know, Granville, I can, I can name a few, right, that I went to, including Newcastle only five years ago. Out of, and, you know, I was in my 50s up here in Newcastle trying to go to TAFE and not, there was, and I had, you know, Similar story, I had a non-Indigenous person trying to teach me Indigenous studies um, because nobody as an Indigenous woman and a senior Indigenous woman took me serious when I spoke. So I believed that to fit into this world, I needed an education that had a piece of paper to it. So in 2018, Charles, 2019, what are we now, 22, 4? four years, so let's go back four years ago, five years ago, I rocked up at a place called Wallatuka at Newcastle University. And I said, can I come here and get an education, stop laughing, Charlotte, <laughs> without being victimised and, and being treated with racism? Because I've yet to find a place that I can go and learn and without that happening, because there was no safe space for us to get an education. So whilst we are having, you know, a lot of PhD students coming through, and I don't know what the stats were, I know a couple of years ago, Anissa might be able to um, verify, there was only about 400 Indigenous with PhDs. Is that right, Charles? There's about 800 now. 800 now. Well, there yeah. you go. That That's just in the last couple of years, that's doubled. Um, and, you know, it, give me another four years, five years, and you can add my name to that list because I ain't dying without one because um, I wasn't good enough to get married either and I'm not having miss on my headstone. So, um, but, yeah, now there's not many Wallatookas. That, um, I was glad to hear there's um, Jeremy mention about the one in Sydney. Um, they allow though these places are not specialised teaching places. We don't get degrees handed to us out of the Kellogg's Corn Flakes box. We actually have to earn and pay hex fees like everybody else. And, but however, these places allow us a safe space to learn in without those things that inhibit us as such things as inclusivity at university. The only way we get that is by being around our own mobs, feeling safe without being 
Um, and when we say safe, we don't mean people coming up to us calling us names. We mean lecturers teaching students 30 odd in a room incorrectly about our mobs and our places and just things like that. And yes, we do have to be the token blacks. We do have to become the educators, even though we're the students or the undergrads that are there learning. That just reinforces that we're still not in a safe space in these places. So for me, access is in and inclusivity is in unity in universities means that I have to educate lecturers and other students about at the at the risk of being um, not expelled. What do you call it when you get kicked out of uni? Kicked out of uni. Yeah, well, you know, that thing that I've had to face a few times for speaking up, but we'll address that in question two, Charlene, won't we? So, um, yeah, you know, at the risk of, um, and sometimes for us, yes, that in that in that space, emotionally becomes emotionally charged for us because sometimes some of the subjects are so raw to our hearts and our own experiences that it evokes emotion in us. And sometimes, you know, it's exhausting trying to have to explain that the system is this way and, and it's caused us to be, we're not angry blacks. None of us are angry blacks. We're just tired and frustrated and we just want an education. That's me, that's what inclusivity means. Yeah. Ask someone else, not me. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Um, I just want to add as well, um, you know, from a, from a staff member's perspective, um, inclusivity is really important as well. I'm one of only six Aboriginal people to have a PhD in management and business. Um, and it's a very lonely place. And I work in a mainstream business school. And what I've tried to do is surround myself with um, other Aboriginal people. So at um, University of Queensland, we have now seven Aboriginal academics working in the business school, which is unheard of in any other university around the country. Um, and we have another five or six professional staff. So it's, a, it's, it's starting to be a really inclusive environment because it can be very exclusive um, for those of us who are, you know, with PhDs and working in, in mainstream schools, um, as opposed to, you know, if we were working in an Aboriginal centre that has um, uh, courses that run out of it. So um, thanks, everyone, for that. That was great. So our question number two is... Access to universities can be difficult for some Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Um, can you please talk about your experience around this? Um, so I'm going to go again to Jeremy first. Cool. Thanks, Charlene. Um, yeah, I actually went to Newcastle University for undergraduate area. Um, what I took it back then was that little tiny house. It's not like it was now. Um, so it was very small. It was great student support there. Um, but growing up, I was the first to finish year 12 in my family, first to go to university. Um, so I actually wasn't really fan to look at university back then. I uh, had a great, some great people around me who suggested to go, and I'm glad I did because I've done a few degrees since then and now work in the sector. Uh, but it is difficult still for a lot of people. Um, I think, like what Tracy said, sometimes people think they're not worthy to go to university. Um, we're not smart enough and things like that because they didn't get the right HSC uh, marks. I think it's really important that we do make it so there's opportunities for our people um, to come here as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I think, and Lisa and Tracy both mentioned that we don't get things for free. Uh, we're here on merit. That's a really key thing. Um, so when people do come here, it, it's merit-based. Uh, like for example, in our fact, we're trying to increase our numbers. Uh, we, don't, we, had, we used to have an Aboriginal support unit within our faculty and it got moved on unfortunately um, a lot of universities do that they centralize things now and they take things out and mess things around when they're working uh, which is a bit of a shame but working with students i'll do a lot of work with the students here um, 
black and white students and they you hear the same thing. There's a lot of issues around racism still at the university sector. Um, people, I, I think everyone here knows that, uh, but people outside wouldn't realize it's still a racist element within our university. Um, making sure there's actually options there for people to um, get support is really key. Um, like Tracy mentioned, having, um, and, and Lisa as well, about having people who are educated actually be able to give um, training to our students, especially Aboriginal staff like, like Charlene um, as an academic, be able to teach our, our students is really important. That's something we're trying to boost here as well, trying to increase our staff. Um, we've got one of the highest staff rates at the university, um, at University of Sydney, but percentage wise, it's really low. But if we can increase that and make sure that anyone teaching our subjects, uh, Aboriginal focused subjects are from our mob, it's gonna help not only increase the um, satisfaction and quality of our teaching, especially for the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but also educate the non-Indigenous people and raise that. Um, so I think it's really important that we do have something in place where we can embed that because it's still hard. Um, some universities do programs to get people in. Um, I got in on my ATAR at Newcastle, but some of my friends went through the um, one year prep course, which is great. It gives them experience. Uh, we don't do that here at Sydney, unfortunately. Um, my last university in New South, New South Wales Uni, we did that. We did a pre program. You get through that, you're straight to university. Um, Merit based, of course. And that was, that was getting the six or seven faculties, which is great. It's something we're trying to look at doing here um, because if you get more opportunities, people come in, um, it's great. Uh, we do a, um, a community oriented course here, which is really great in public health. Um, and I, I saw some of the students two days ago um, when I was out on campus. And there's a range of people there for professionals, the community um, leaders and community uh, members. So it gives those opportunities um, to get into university and actually move on to another degree, hopefully uh, down the track. But if, if we can make sure that it's, it's a safe, like I said, for a safe place, um, where we can actually focus on our issues um, across the sector. If every university can do that, we're going to see more, more of our people coming, more opportunities for our mob to come here as well. Um, I don't care where, which university students go to, I, I would love to see more of our people actually studying because like Shelley said, there's only six in business, or five now, because one passed away for actually a couple of years ago. Um, but he's a good friend of mine as well. So there's not many in business doing that. So I encourage more of our mob to actually look at those um, undergrade and postgrad um, qualifications because opportunities are there. Uh, we just have to make sure that the community know about that and also make sure the community are welcome to come to university. I still see a lot of people in Redfern who are too scared to walk through University of Sydney. I don't think it's, they're allowed to. So making those opportunities out there um, is really, really important. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Anissa, I know that you have a lot to say on this one. <laughs> You're on mute, Kaz. You know me so well. Um, so <laughs> being in a space where um, it, education, obviously, little ones all the way to adults, that's my experience. Preschool all the way to year 12 and then adults. Um, I've taught at primary schools, high schools, um, TAFE and university. So I was teaching at, um, at Macquarie last year for the Darugnuri unit. Um, and that was great. It was great. It was, you know, amazing to do that. And I was co-teaching with someone who um, has a TAE, so a Cert for in training and assessment, but no higher qualifications than that. And it was disheartening for me because the knowledge that, she was bringing to the table um you know you know it's okay to do this but you've got to have these quals and I think that's what bogs us down with a lot of things um we see that in TAFE with even trying to get language access to universities is similar like um I would love to teach teachers in the education section of a uni and I do outside of it um you know like how to actually teach Aboriginal people and our needs and um you know it's it's kind of interesting people go oh oh I didn't get that at uni and that's that's where it starts is that education space of it's got to be embedded throughout our university education courses first because if we don't do that we're having that cycle continue 
and I've had people come to me in the last five years of they've just graduated and they go, oh, I didn't know about that. We did this for a semester and that was it. And, you know, I think we've moved past it being a minor thing, um, you know, and that's really, that can be disheartening. And having to tell people, you can still go to university. And they're like, no, no, I'm not smart enough. And I go, what a load of crap. And sorry, I said crap. I was going to say something else, but crap was a better word. Um, you know, because I'm training, I'm mentoring people in their TAE at the moment that are Aboriginal. And that's, and I mean, it's a Cert 4, which is, you know, AQF level, as Charlene was in this meeting before, is considerably lower than a bachelor and a, and a master's and so on. And they're thinking they're stupid. And it's not the course, it's not them that's stupid. It's the way the courses are written they really aren't written for Aboriginal people and they really don't include our ways of knowing, being and doing. Um, I've got community members who are speaking language, but because they don't have the piece of paper, which is what Tracy said, they can't deliver um, languages. Uh, we've got five Aboriginal language teachers at TAFE across the state of New South Wales. I will be the sixth one next year. Um, that is it. And New South Wales ain't a small state. I mean, I've lived in the ACT, that's tiny. Um, but it, it, it hinders us in doing this. And, you know, I would love to do my PhD, but I don't know if my prior work and all my other research and everything else I've done, you know, is there a way to go that way and, and be accredited for the, for the work I've already done without having to jump through 20 billion hoops and give up five years of my life. Um, but it also is off-putting. And, you know, I, I'm always building my students up. I've got someone who now wants to be a teacher from one of my diploma classes. And I'm like, yes, because we need, we need more. But the way I teach is not the way that other people teach because I do that holistic approach and, you know, I understand it, I get it. And, you know, it, it, I think we over... We over well, not even quantify, but we over qualify the roles. Teaching is naturally what we used to do. So we're an oral based language. We didn't have reading and writing. We had an amazing memory um, of being able to retain copious amounts of information. Um, that to me is high level of intelligence. But when you look at the Western system, it requires a piece of paper. I, I think there needs to be a well, to quote Martin Nakata, there needs to be a cultural interface here happening where the knowledge that we have is, is equivalent, if not more, to the requirements. And that's where we will see that wall breaking down um, because there's only so much, you know, some of us can do without getting real tired and sick and stressed out. And, you know, I'd love to see a lot more black fellas in education um, at university level, TAFE, you name it. I keep asking, um, you know, I think it needs to be a safe space, but it also needs to recognize our skill sets that aren't always about writing. So, you know, it's not always about reading. It's not always about any of those. We are listening, oral based languages, you know, um, we're very visual type people in terms of we used, we used symbolism, we used yarning and stories, you know, it, that was our way of learning. And when you look at the fact that we were the first bakers, the first aquaculturalists, the first agriculturalists, you know, all of these amazing things, we knew not to intermarry before science was coined, you know, that sort of stuff is, is cutting edge understanding without half the, the tools that we have today to identify that if you do intermarry, you're going to have some genetic issues, you know, so there's all these great things that we have been able to do in the past, but um, the last 200 years of us looking like the, you know, um, it's what Darwin is, Darwin's paternalistic sort of mentality of, you know, oh, they're, they're Aboriginal people, so they've got a small brain, ergo, they're dumb. Um, Einstein had a smaller brain, just saying. He was a genius. Um, so, you know, that belief that we are dumb is, is coined because we didn't read and write, not because we didn't know what we were doing, but it was against, we were measured against the British system of education and we still are. So that's why I think our access has been um, difficult. And, you know, there are ways to, to show our understanding 
without having to write a, a 4,000 word essay, which I've had to do. So um, for one of my masters, but you know, those sorts of things, there's, there's other ways to do it. And we need to find that workaround because it's the knowledge that and the skill that the person can give. It's not about how well they can write something. And, and, and I think we really need to remove ourselves. It's the same with the, you know, HSC and ATAR and all that sort of stuff. You know, we've got the big picture program where kids are coming into university based on projects that they've done in areas of relevance and they are getting a Guernsey into university and not all unis are doing it, but that's a way to get around that HSC. Like my youngest was early entry into uni and asked her teachers, why am I doing HSC? You know, why am I doing the exams then if I'm early entry? Um, you know, so, and I said the same thing when I was younger, why am I doing this exam? Because, you know, it had to write an essay um, and do some questions. So I think it really takes away from our ability to show who we are and what we can do and have respect for us as Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, if there's anyone out there that is Torres Strait Islander, um, we're more than, than, than what the perception has been for the last 230 plus years. And uh, we are amazing. We, we really are amazing people. And as you can see, there are a lot of things that have been changed on country um, since, you know, 1788. And now we're sort of, you know, climate change, rep, you know, and all that sort of thing, um, copping it because we didn't, we didn't do what, what happens and flooding and everything else. So our knowledge was actually quite important and respectful and holistic. Um, and now it's just, oh, you've got to get a number. And I think that's really disappointing um, to a lot of mob. And that's what puts them off is I can't compare because I'm not good enough. Well, they are good enough. It's just a different way. So different way of learning and that should be accounted and we do that for students with dyslexia we do that for students with other disabilities we don't do it for aboriginal people and that's the the major issue i've got a staff a colleague whose english is his fifth language he speaks he's from anangu he speaks four languages before english and he's an amazing teacher can he go to university right now and do a bachelor of adult ed no because he has to do all this writing as opposed to the skill sets He's amazing as a teacher. I've, I've done it for 20 years. I've never come across someone who is just that good. And, you know, that to me says, why aren't we just giving him that piece of paper then? Because he's obviously got the skills and the talent and you learn more on prac than you do in a, in a lecture hall. Just saying, sorry, Charlene. Um, but it's true. It's a practical application of your skill set. So if you don't do that, you know, that's the best way to, to demonstrate your understanding. But I'm going to stop now because I could go down that rabbit hole forever. And as Charlene said, I, I had a lot to say. I know the next person has a lot to say on this, Tracy. So just before you do, Trace, Tracy and I both came through um, alternate pathways into university. Um, and then I went on to teach the alternate pathway, which is the RPUG program at Newcastle Uni and I taught in that program for um, 12 years before I left to go to UQ. So um, over to you, Tracy. Okay, so I've, I've got two examples and then I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit, but um, being Indigenous, this is the way we explain things. This is the way we ask people to understand how you know difficult it is for us. So go back 40 years ago, I'm starting year 10 and I'm in maths and I re still remember my maths teacher and good looking 25 year old fellow he was, I got him straight out of uni in year seven and I had him for four years. And here I am sitting there at the back of the class because that's where we had to sit being black. And he says to me, Tracy, I have been teaching you for four years fractions and you still can't get it. So I said, did you ever stop to think it's the way you F and teach it? And I upended the table and I walked down. So of course at lunch, sorry, but if you've been teaching me that same thing for four years and I still haven't got it, why is it my fault, right? So, and it's okay to laugh because this is a true story, right? So over the PA, 1,200 kids in the school, Marston Height, just outside of Parramatta, I get called up. And, it, you know, of course, I'm ribbed all the way across the, course, the quadrangle, ridiculed. Ah, ha, ha, she's gone to the maths teacher's classroom. So I get up there and Mr Dudley's sitting there with the head of maths, Mr Brun. 
here, listen, 42 years later, I still remember their names, right? So it's quite significant to me. I'm sitting there and he's got an orange and he goes, I don't know why you can't understand fractions. I said, as I said, who said it's my fault? But anyway, he's got an orange and he peels it. He goes, what's this? And I sort of roll my eyes and go, it's an orange. And he goes, yeah, but it's a whole orange, isn't it? And I said, if you say so. He breaks the orange in half and he says to me, now what have I got? I said, a broken freaking orange. He said, no, I've got two halves of an orange. Word for word verbatim, this is the story, right? I've been telling it for 40 odd years. So he puts the two halves of the orange back together. And he says, now what have I got? I said, a super glued orange, because I didn't know what he wanted me to say, right? So he goes, no, I've got a whole orange. So two halves make one whole. I said, okay, I'll play. Then he breaks the two halves into quarters. And he says to me, what have I got now? And I've got this bloke, he's, he's like, he's like, oh, this bloke, right? So I said, listen, get to the get to the point. What, what you're trying to say to me? He said, this is fractions. Two quarters make a half, two halves make a whole. He said, that's fractions. I said, why didn't you bring the F and orange four years ago, you dumb bastard, and I left. So excuse my language, that's the story that tells. But if that's what it takes to teach an Aboriginal person the simple basics of fractions, what's it going to hurt you to bring the damn orange? It's nothing. It's simple. But if we can't understand what's on the blackboard and the way it's written, bring the damn orange. Now, fast forward 40 years. I'm in Charlene's lecture. She's I dead now. <laughs> I've just been accepted into university into the Yapug program. I'm going to university. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn how to be a university student. So the very and I'm disabled as well. Not that that's an issue, but um, it doesn't hold me back. So I've rocked up in our very first lecture at university, and Charlene's teaching it. So I'm sitting there for the whole two hours. I'm taking it all in. I'm writing notes. You know, Charlene's talking. I'm like sitting up the back like a good little black kid. Mind you, they were all black kids in, in that room, but I was sitting up the back like I was used to. And I'm taking all these notes. And at the end of the two hours, Charlene says to me, or to everyone, sorry, in the lecture hall of 200 seats, now, is there any questions? So I sat back because I wanted to see what all the kids asked so I didn't sound dumb, right? So... And nobody asked no questions. And I'm like, oh, these lot are all smart in here, eh? So I thought, oh, okay, I've got to ask. So I put my hand up and Charlene looks right up the back because she's down the front. And she goes, yes, Tracy. And I said, because Charlene said all oh, lecture, open a folder for this and a subfolder for that. And you need another folder for this and another folder for that. So she says, yes, Tracy, what's your question? I said, how many folders I've got to go and buy because I couldn't keep up with the count? I didn't know you had to do all this on a laptop. Like, nobody told me that. She just said folders. So, um, yeah, talk about dumb, right? So here's the thing. Um, it is difficult for an Indigenous student, whether they be 18 or 58, going to you. You don't need to hide your head no more, Charles. It's over. You don't teach me no more, right? You've got to feel sorry for the law lecturers at New, at new Space in New South Wales. So anyway, um, but I'll get to that in question three. Um, but, yeah, it is difficult for us. And to feel, you know, um, uh, you know, to to talk about our experiences at university is hard. I'd rather give you the funny stories which still depict, funny but true stories which true, do depict our difficulties, just our basic, and keep laughing and it's because it's true, I every word of it. Mr Dudley still remembers me. I went to the 30 year reunion not so long ago, or might have been 10 years ago, but anyway, you know what I'm saying. And um, yeah, so I'd rather give you the funny stories that depict us as a student at university. And, you know, he's a qualified Indigenous teacher. Um, well, clearly it must have been me this time because everybody else in the room understood what, what Charlene was saying about the folders. 
right? But um, she will also tell you the following week when I arrived at Treasury Studies class that she was teaching, I did have the darn pink folder just because I didn't know how to use the laptop. Um, and I also had at the same time, the wonderful Michelle Bovell teaching me um, professional practice as an, you know, with an Indigenous side of it. And um, I was sitting in the classroom, all Indigenous kids in there, but I was still up the back in the back row. And because um, I didn't want to, you know, everybody behind me thinking, looking at me, the dumb kid in the class. Um, and, you know, Michelle's like, you know, just um, write down, you know, in word, blah, 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 blah. So everybody's writing, everybody's taking notes and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what word does she want me to write? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you remember this one? Well, the whole class just went silent. There was no tap, tap, tap on the keyboard or anything else. And Michelle looked at me and she goes, Aunt, you got a laptop? I said, yeah. She goes, open it. <laughs> I thought it was just for me to look cool, you know? So <laughs> in the, I know, it's hard to believe I'm an undergrad doing two degrees at the moment. I get it. Because four years ago, I didn't know what a Word document was. But we get there. Don't give up on us as students because just because we're black, um, I know I know there's not that many of us, but there are more and more people my age um, seeking that education we never got in the 60s and the 70s. You know, um, my mum never got past, um, well, we called it first form back in the days, year seven. Um, she had to repeat it five times because she was in a Catholic orphanage going to the Catholic school, you know, and by their standards, she wasn't good, you know, could, wasn't good enough to graduate. But, you know, I'll, I'll finish off by saying this. When I graduated and Charlene was there, her and the dean stand up on the stage trying to choke me afterwards because I was such a pain in the ass to teach. Um, and we got photos to prove it. But after all of that, I went to my mum because my mum was there. And I'm the eldest, you know, in our family. And um, I'm not the first to go to university in, in our family because my children went before me to university, um, except the youngest she's, she's going to there now. But I went to my mum and I said to my mum, mum, like, are you proud of me? I've actually earned this degree in Open Foundations. It's a university certificate. Are you proud of me? And my mum said, yeah, but you had to wait till I had one foot in a bloody grave. You couldn't have done it any earlier. And I'm thinking, just, you know, this is our life, you know. We deserve to be there. Um, I'm so proud now. And my son's just finished a master's degree in business, um, uh, sorry, in commerce and economics. You know, he's at the university in Toowoomba there. And um, he's the only black kid there. Like the Indigenous unit at Toowoomba, I think it's Southern Eastern, is it? Charlene, what's that? What's University US, of Southern Queensland? USQ or something. Yeah. Um, and they ask him questions, you know, um, at there about, you know, studying as, and this, and this man is 34, my son, yesterday. He's married, he works full time in the Treasury Department of, of the Police Bank you know, um, doing all sorts of amazing things. And, you know, he's the only black fella there. And, you know, oh, there she goes. Thanks, Charles, you found it. Everybody have a giggle. <laughs> That's the day I graduated and got, got my certificate to go. And so it took Charlene's belief in me not giving up on me being the most uninformed um, uh, university student there was. I didn't even know how to use a laptop or a Word document or what a folder was in a laptop. I just, as I said, I just bought it to be cool and look like I belonged. I didn't know how to use it. So, you know, and, and it was Charlene chipping away at me that whole year in 2018, 2019. Um, and the many, many times I broke down and cried and said, I don't know why I thought I could do this. I'm too dumb for this because society had told me my whole life 
as a black fella, I was dumb, I was stupid, I didn't belong, I didn't fit in. Um, and my whole life I've been an activist and a fighter and on the front line fighting for the rights of our people, never being taken serious. I'd front up to the Supreme Court and tell the judge he was wrong and, the, and how to handle things with a black fella and I still do it today, you know, I get, but I was never, ever taken seriously or respected for my knowledge on how to solve a situation with an alleged criminal. That's why I went, you know, went to court. But um, when I've got um, coroners ringing me regularly to resolve issues with deaths in custody and things like that, and, you know, why do I have those expertise, but I don't have that piece of paper to be respected with the knowledge that I have? So I, all I can say is that um, our experiences, whilst unique to everybody else in amongst our mobs, they're very similar in a lot of ways, a lot of stories. And I just want to say before, thanks for listening to us and thanks for being on here today because this is what is actually inclusiveness is all about. This is it here, right here, right now. So right today, as, as I'm sure all of you guys are in Adelaide at a university or around Australia, wherever you are, this is what it's about, you know, for all of us because our history is your history too. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Trace. And I just want to add a little bit. I remember, um, and I used to say that every beginning of every single year at your pug, um, coming to university is not about being smart or how smart you are. It's how you actually apply yourself and how much you want to learn and get to the end. Because, I mean, you know, similar experience to Trace. I'm slightly older than Tracy, but... Um, you know, we, um, we've been downtrodden all of our lives and told us we were stupid and wouldn't amount to anything. And um, I went back to my school reunion recently and waved my PhD in front of my maths teacher's face who told me I was stupid and dumb and expelled me. Um, and um, he saw red and I was like, what? sorry, I stuck it up in. <laughs> anyway, we're just going to move on. But didn't know. sorry, Charles. But didn't you want to thank him for being the prick he was? Because no, sorry, no, I didn't, I didn't mean to want say to thank that. Him for anyone, because he was no. Because he was if he hadn't have put like me and my son, my son was told he'd be lucky to be a garbage collector, and that and I'm sorry, but that was only 15 years ago, right? Yeah. And I said to the psychologist back then, "What do they earn about a grand a week?" And she said, "Yeah." And I said, "Come on, mate, we don't need to be here. You're going to be right." And we left. So. I thank those people that ridiculed us, that said we wouldn't amount to much To I thank them for saying to us, we're too dumb, we're too stupid. Um, we'd never amount to much or we'd never have an education. Because if it wasn't for those people, we wouldn't be the people that, that the driven people that we are today to achieve what we want to achieve. Because that little nagging voice in the back of our head saying, you can't do it, you're too dumb, is what really inspires us to prove that we're not. And if it wasn't for that, you wouldn't have taken that PHP back to him and waved it in his face. Well done. I would have done the same. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I'm going to jump a question now because we are going to be running out of time, aren't we, Piper? Um, so I'm going to ask, how can we make our universities more inclusive? Um, so, Jeremy. Thanks, Charlene. Um, I want to touch base on what um, Anissa said about uh, Professor Naka. He's a good friend of mine. Um, like Tracy, is a mature student. So giving those opportunities is really important. Um, with him, we worked together at Narangili, which is at New South Wales University. Um, it was all about that inclusivity and actually making sure students were listened to. So sometimes we're in management over there, but sometimes we're sitting with students for an hour, two hours, having a hearing about what's going on in their lives and, and what um, can be done better. Um, 
But being inclusive is it's really important that everyone comes out on the, on the same level of us uh, because you can have people saying, yeah, we'll be inclusive and nothing happens out of it. We need clear plans. Um, we need student bodies to support us. Um, I know the SRC here at University of Sydney, I do a lot of work with them uh, and they're great. Um, so they listen to what we're doing, listen to the issues that are happening. Um, there's a few issues I won't go into today, but that we're working on with the student body um, to address. I think it's really important that they work with us as staff and students. Um, one of the big things that I've found as a student is people just being in touch and having a yarn, um, offering opportunities out there. Um, even though, like I said, I'm online in Sydney at Griffith University in Queensland, getting the emails every couple of days, um, what's going on, uh, what support's out there. It shows me that they care about our students and they care about making sure it's an inclusive space where we can come together. Um, whether you're an undergrad, straight out of school or a student like Tracy, everyone's equal. Um, that's something that as Aboriginal people, we see we're all equal. Um, if I see a student of a yarn, um, they could be in different faculty, but it's important to understand what they're going through. And if they raise something, um, I can leverage off that as well through not only my management role at uni, but my role at the union as well. So I can actually push the agenda there. And we've heard things like racism happening, um, cultural safety issues, not being given access to um, material they should have, um, things like that. But I think if we can make sure that everyone works together um, and that's a common ground. And I just really believe that the, what we're doing here is today, listen to our, our stories, like Tracy's got some awesome stories and this there as well. Hearing about that, um, hearing how things were bad back then, um, things have improved, which is great, but there's still a lot of improvement done. Um, and if we can work together, Black, White, Brindle, come together and make sure that there is an Aboriginal voice at your university, um, that is a strong voice. Um, you guys support us as well. That's really, really key because we can't get things done unless the other um, areas of our community support what we're doing. So if you can come together with whichever university it is, with your student body, Aboriginal liaison officer there, or your students or your staff body in the Aboriginal units, and work on their things, um, understand different cultural aspects. Um, I'm not sure if you've got um, cultural competency at your university and things like that. I know in the education sector, they're using a video we did at University of Sydney a few years ago on you can't answer that question. Uh, I was on part of that, it was really cool. So if you, if you Google that, you will see that. Um, a staff and student coming together and people just, some of the questions we get asked every day. Um, sometimes people don't realize we still get asked questions like how black are we and things like that. So it's understanding that is really key because if you understand that and the issues we're facing, it makes it a bit easier to work on our agenda as well. So I think that's a really key thing about be inclusive, work together, work with us. Forgot I was on mute, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Anissa. Oh God, I'm gonna say the same thing. And just so you know, Jeremy, I show that video to everybody and I've included it in courses that I'm doing curriculum for at TAFE. So look out, you're a star. Um, you know, it's 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 true though. We need to we need to have Aboriginal voices, but we also need for people to listen to those Aboriginal voices. So you know, um, you can't just keep saying, "Oh, look, this is really not comfortable," and then no one's listening to you. And I find that in my role at the moment, I've got Aboriginal students coming to me about issues, and I'm a teacher I'm not the support staff but because they respect me enough I will find people to help them and I think that's what we do um, you know when we want change or, or when you see something that you know shouldn't be said uh, you know just stand up and support um, the Aboriginal student or staff member because that that little thing whilst it's not tokenistic it actually you go oh Thank you. You know, it, you knowing someone's there who will say what you're saying is wrong. And that could be in course content. You know, as I said, when we talked about, I talked about brain size, you know, if you're in the medical and they say, oh, people have small brains and you blah, 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 you go, no, um, you know, it's those sorts of things. And, and a lot of, a lot of um, visuals that you will see about Aboriginal people are usually dark skin, lap, lap, desert people where, that's only a small percentage. There's saltwater, there's plains people, there's 
you know, river mob. There's, you know, so many different types, but everyone just assumes because the advertising or something says, and that's where our mind mindset goes. So, you know, oh, you're not Aboriginal. Oh, how much are you Aboriginal? Like all of those things. Watch the video that Jeremy was talking about. It is a really, really good one. Um, and, you know, if, if you feel that the lecture is not being accurate, have that conversation with your lecturer. If you don't feel comfortable, go and see the Aboriginal support people at your work, you know, in the university. Have a conversation with them. They could possibly go and have a conversation. You know, it, it, it has to change in a good way um, and not, oh, you're a, an insert expletive. Um, and off you go. And I think that's the biggest issue is that there's this perception and actual reality and we need people to speak up and support us and it shouldn't just always be coming from us. So if you feel it's wrong, ask, do you think this is wrong as well or whatever, but don't just not do anything because I think that's really important that we work together um, to deal with to deal with stuff and you know sometimes you know books take forever to come out that are actually accurate and and things don't change as quick as we would like them to in this day and age so feel free to actually do that all right i'm done <laughs> thanks anissa now tracy we've got two minutes and i know you're not going to be able to squeeze anything you've got to say into two oh, minutes. hang on that's yeah i can i'm gonna really honor you now charlene so um just because I write, oh, I've lost you. Where are you gone? Can you see me? There you go. Yeah, yeah, we can see I you. I still can't use a computer and I'm four years into this degree stuff. Anyway, okay, just quickly, um, you will, especially, uh, let me concentrate on me because I can only speak about me. I can't speak for all mobs. But at you will, at best, see one Indigenous student in a degree at a time. That's not inclusiveness because I'm there on my own right? So we need more students, whether they're high school students or non-high school students or mature aged adults, encouraged to go to university. Because at best over, when did Sapphire graduate, Charlene, five years ago, something like that? Mm -hmm. There has been one Indigenous student and, there's only, and I'm the fifth Indigenous student to come out of your pug, Wallatuka, to go to law school at New Space. That doesn't make it a safe space for me, okay? Especially when I'm an outspoken activist of a black, you know, and I'm studying law, it's not easy. You know, last year I had constitutional law and I had a run in with the professor and I'd had him three years in a row because I failed that subject, right? But there was 34 kids in that, students in that room studying I could not with good grace allow him to continue educating people on the 1967 referendum with it out being on I was referred to in that class by many students as they or them that was not a safe lecture for me to be in so obviously Tracy's going to arc up, but this time I was down the front of the class, so everybody had seen me for God, always in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I stood up and I turned around and I pointed at this 20-year-old non, well, I'm going to say Anglo-Saxon descendant student, and I said to her, do not call me they or them again. I am a proud Awabakal Gwagal elder and you will respect me. I said, I was born before this stupid 1967 referendum. And I said, your lecturer wasn't even an itch in his daddy's, you know what, I, I won't repeat the words. So sometimes we explode up and we've got an arc up, but that kid came to me a week later because I was super embarrassed after all of this and ended up leaving the, leaving the lecture because I couldn't bring my emotions back into check because it was frustrating as hell the third time I've had this lecturer, same subject, everything else. But he was allowing the students in that class that were non-Indigenous, and I was the only Indigenous, to refer to us as they or them and weren't considered human, repeating all the rhetoric from the 1960s. That's got to stop. It has to be corrected in lectures 
it has you have to correct the lecturer you have to correct the students that's not tolerable that young girl came to me where I thought I was going to get expelled from uni again because that's a semester average for me um in it shelling <laughs> on average I'm up for suspension at least once a semester um and not not just for those either but she came to me a week later and I thought oh god this girl's walking towards me the shame right she come up to thank me and I said you're thanking me for telling you off and she goes no she goes that night I went home and my dad and I had an argument and I said over what and she said the 1967 67 referendum do you know he's still calling you lot aborigine and I said well you know if it took that I said I'm sorry on the delivery that I gave you but I said I had just had enough of it and I said I'm sitting there I was born before 1967 I said it hurt here we are you know nearly 60 years later and I'm still being called they or them and you know not considered human back then and I said Andy's not telling you the truth about the 1967 referendum either but I'll tell you something, if you know anyone doing a law degree as a student, a lot of, and not just Marbo, a lot of the high court cases that have challenged this country's constitution has been because of a black fella. Tasmanian Dam, Marbo, you know, the list just goes on and on and on and on. So we have, you know, just bring us to the table. If you're going to have a panel on Indigenous First Nations people of this country's issues, you better bring the black fellas with you because that's where you're going to get the knowledge from. Just include us. Just accept us as equal because we're pretty young. Is that short enough, Charles? Thanks, Tracy. Only four minutes over. You did well. Um, you should see my podcast. <laughs> um, I want to thank our three um, students for coming along. Um, Anissa, Jeremy and Tracy. Um, can we give them a bit of a round of applause? What a great insight into access and um, inclusivity for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. Um, while I've got the floor, just a quick shout out to Aidan. Hi, Aidan. Haven't seen you in a while. Um, and if there are any uh, Aboriginal postgrad students here who aren't a member, NATSAPA is your National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Postgrad Association. Um, I highly recommend that you join your postgrad association. But even for you, you know, everyone else that's here get involved in your um, student politics on campus because it's a really worthwhile thing. And, um, you know, at, for those of us who've sat at a peak level um, doing this work for years, it's really important that we have um, amazing students stepping up and doing this work because without our voices, our voices are not heard. And that's really important in our university. We need to have our voices heard. So. Thank you very much, Piper, for inviting me to do this session. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you for facilitating, Charlene, and it was just such a joy to um, listen um, for that hour. So thank you so much to each of you. Yes, thank you, Charlene, Tracy, and Nisa, Jeremy, and to everyone who contributed and engaged in such an inspiring session. It was so great to hear all your stories and experiences. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.